Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode two of the Catholic Catechesis podcast. This is my final project for my catechetical uh, ministry class. And I am very pleased to have with me two of my very close friends, two very uh, fantastic club officers, witnesses to the pro-life cause, Kateri, President of Crusaders for Life, and Sam, who is the uh, prayerful presence officer for Crusaders for Life. I definitely didn't almost forget what you do for the club, Sam. <laughs> No, no, that's all right. All right. I get that a lot. <laughs> I, I, I'm a self-proclaimed quasi-officer. Of <laughs> that's even, though, even though I, I have no real, no real title, no real, no real purpose. I just hang around after the meetings. Yeah. We wouldn't have made through Anacostia without Germ, that's for sure. Oh, hell no, absolutely not. <laughs> y'all, y'all need it. Y'all needed my, my, my experience there. So, Thank you guys for, for being here, for talking with me about this uh, this subject. I think catechesis is something that a lot of people don't um, think about when they think about kind of how um, we educate, like, not only youth, but also um, adult converts to the faith in America. Um, and can, people just kind of dismiss it as, oh, we'll just teach them the prayers, we'll teach them, like, to read the Bible, and that's kind of about it. But there's a lot more to it. First of all, what I wanted to cover with you guys first was kind of your, your own experience, your personal experience with catechesis. So first off, like, where did y'all get your religious education? What did you like your formation growing up? Um, <clears throat> well, for me, a lot of it came from my parents uh, and just sort of like questions that I would ask my dad or like, it's like during preparation for First Holy Communion was the first time that I really remember uh, having explicitly like, you know, um, I don't know, Catholic teachings that, you know, my, my dad was you know, instructing me in, um, <clears throat> there was, yeah. So it was very like informal for a lot of it, sort of like mm -hmm. what was necessary for the sacrament. Um, and then we would read a lot of saints lives and, uh, and then around, I guess, so I guess this was before this was in third grade. Mm -hmm. We did something called catechesis of the good shepherd, um, Ooh. which I think is, is connected to, uh, Montessori. Uh, mm -hmm. which is sort of like a more hands-on approach um, to like mm -hmm. the biblical stories. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of like early, but I don't know about Kateri. What did she have to say? Kateri, yeah, to I was, um, <laughs> I was homeschooled. So my family did a online or it was online later, but um, we did a curriculum with mother of divine grace um, homeschool program. And in that we, um, we like went through the catechism, um, like the children's catechism, like the questions, why did God make you kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then along with homeschooling, I also went to a CCD class. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of an added thing. My mom was like, oh, this is a good way to get you to do other things outside of homeschooling, right. <laughs> make friends and stuff. Um, and I don't remember the book. There was like a set book um, that we went through. I think it was Jesuit. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, it was just like a lot of Bible stories and kind of little reflections and um, some St. Lives, usually like teaching on the Ten Commandments. Um, mm -hmm. But then, yeah, I got more and more in depth in high school and we started to learn like actual philosophy of God and like proving his existence and um, proving why Jesus is God after proving God's existence. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that was, I guess, my main catechesis mm -hmm. growing up. Right. So, um, do y'all, like, I, I missed it a little bit, but did you guys, um, go to your parishes for formation or was that more like, I know it's since both of y'all have some hope school in your background or was that like the majority of your, your teaching? It was that at home or in the parish? Um, <clears throat> yeah. So very little of my, uh, my catechesis was at the parish. Um, mm -hmm. we went to a CCD class at modern day, which was my home parish for, right. you know, maybe, Mm, about a year because it was right before confirmation mm -hmm. but other right. than that it was just my dad uh mm -hmm. just your dad. one issue one issue is that <clears throat> catholic schools would be would seem to be a good way to get catechesis but they're mm -hmm. like so expensive that yeah we yeah went, we were homeschooled first and then we went to a charter school mm -hmm. uh, for high school and they don't i mean it's public school so they don't teach right uh, right so it was mostly at home Terry, mm -hmm. Nine. Well, it was 
mostly at home too, just because of homeschooling. But then the CCD class was through our local parish as well. So um, yeah, it was through them more, but that was even more just like supplementary mm-hmm. um, community building, more Catholic community building. Perfect. Um, do y'all mm-hmm. re- do y'all kind of remember the way that it was taught? Do y'all have um, well? maybe since you're homeschooled, it wasn't maybe a, a box program, but did you have a curriculum like from outside that was set up? Or mm-hmm. did, did y'all's parents like kind of self-develop their own little program in the way that they taught you? Well, oh. ours had, oh, sorry. Sam. <laughs> um, ours had a curriculum. I don't remember all the books that we read. Um, we definitely did like the children's Catholic catechism. And then um, the one that I mainly remember we did, um, it was called following Christ in the world. Mm -hmm. And that was like the big, the big one where I like, I think it was just more intellectual at that point. And I was older. So I remember it more. Um, Mm -hmm. But then earlier in high school and maybe in eighth grade or seventh grade, we started reading certain encyclicals or um, different articles um, or church fathers Mm -hmm. that like worked our way into the curriculum, but it was, it wasn't like a set, um, brand of books, I guess, or publisher or um, author that wrote them. It was kind of a hodgepodge of different things that the homeschooling program formulated. Right. What about you, Sam? Um, So we didn't really have much of a curriculum except for, you know, the catechism that they would have for each of the sacraments until Mm -hmm. high school where my dad was teaching a religion class for a couple of our guys who were at Founders as well. Um, Mm -hmm. And we used um, a series called Didache. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I don't want to say this like (laughs) with total certainty, but I think Scott Hahn was involved in at least the first one. Um, But there was a different book. There was one, there was like an introductory one. There was one on the sacraments. There was Mm -hmm. one on the church. There was, uh, and so that was the, the main curriculum that we used. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I I wouldn't, at least around um, here where I live, I think most everybody gets their education at the parish. Um, the, the Catholic school um, nearby, St. John the 23rd, doesn't really have any kind of program for that. Not that it's really their role in education, I guess, because they're kind of trying to appeal and bring in everybody from like all, all walks of life. So it would kind of be out of place to just put a, a Catholic education for religious education like program within the high school curriculum. So I understand that. Um, but I don't, I don't know a lot of homeschoolers here that had their own thing. Even, even the people that I know that were homeschooled had their education at parishes. So um, it was really interesting to hear about that. Um, all right. So how would y'all say that your religious education, the way that you've been you know, brought up has shaped your view now as adults of the church? Um, I think that <clears throat> one thing that I was always struck with growing up was that no matter what the theological question I had, the church had an answer for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, like there is nothing that you can come up with that hasn't been addressed. And, you know, the, the big fat, you know, catechism of the Catholic faith. Yeah. yeah. And so there was always like, <clears throat> I don't know. It was always driven home to me that like, you know, there's been like 2000 years of really brilliant people who really love the church, who've been thinking about these things. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know, it's given me great confidence in, you know, the truth of Catholicism. Uh, I think that would be. Mm-hmm. That's good. How about you, Terry? Um, I agree. I personally, I'm just growing up, I was a very trusting child. I didn't really have a lot of questions. I just kind of took um, everything that the church said and I was like, okay, that makes sense. And then I would just kind of go forward. It never I wasn't as inquisitive until later um, on when more hard hitting questions happened. And I started facing more friends who were um, of different faiths or different lifestyles that um, made me not necessarily question the church, Mm -hmm. but made me more um, interested in the exact things that the church said so that I could back it up. Um, I definitely think that, it definitely like it gave for a solid foundation in knowing things and trusting. Um, but it wasn't until later in high school mm. that I really think it hit home um, for me. 
I guess. Yeah. I went on a couple of spiritual retreats and that kind of just ignited mm-hmm. a flame. And then it was like, I was even more receptive mm-hmm. to catechism after that. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, I think it gave me a really good foundation that I think was definitely needed. Right. Um, so would you, would you guys say that now, like, I guess, um, there's more of that faith there. Um, actually, let me, let me, let me rephrase the question a little bit. If you, if, if you had been catechized differently, say like you'd gone to a parish or maybe, um, through your school or something like that, do you think that that would have made you, um, a little, like, what would that have done for your faith? Do you think in contrast to what you actually received? Mm. Uh, you mean like at a school or at a parish? Yeah, if, if instead of having your, your catechesis at home, you had it mm-hmm. somewhere else, basically. Uh, I think it would depend on how, how good it was. If we're talking about like the totally perfect catechesis at, you know, my parish, you know, then I think that would be, that would be great. And maybe having like the one thing is maybe structure. Mm -hmm. Uh, was lacking a little bit there was kind of like haphazard like it was sort of Mm -hmm. being at home we would like oh that'd be super interesting let's let's read a book on that and so it means i know a lot of like random facts that i think are very fascinating but um uh that is like in college like as i've gone i've been like oh interesting Mm -hmm. Uh, i didn't understand like uh what what the, the tension between, you know, Calvinists and and Catholics were, you know, mm-hmm. just not something we'd, I'd really studied before. Right. Um, right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Oh, sorry, Sam. No, you go ahead. I'm done. <laughs> um, it, it's hard to say too, because it really is just depending on like what teachers you get. Um, I don't, for me, the CCD class through my parish um, wasn't that, great because a lot of the kids and this could be very subjective to like what parish you go to and like your Mm -hmm. community itself but the kids that I was surrounded with um had very different family lives than me a lot of the parents just kind of dropped them off at CCD or their grandparents kind of forced them to go even though the parents didn't really want them to and Mm -hmm. so I was surrounded by a lot of people who always seemed to be starting at ground one um and in that retrospect it wasn't as good for me because I kind of felt like I was sitting through things that I had already learned or it was kind of dumbing things down Mm -hmm. a lot in my own experience versus like being at home. I had my family supporting and backing up and also being actively involved because even though a lot of my um, catechesis was through online classes, it was still at home. My mom was listening to it or my dad was around when I was doing homework for it. And I was Mm -hmm. um, asking them questions or seeking their help in reading certain things, um, which I think was very helpful because then I had that affirmation of my parents. Um, whereas I don't know if I would have gotten that at a Catholic school. I think if I would gone to like a Catholic, um, not homeschool, I guess, like, I don't want to say public school, it's not, but yeah, yeah. if I went to an actual like running building school, um, I think I probably could have gotten a very good cate- um, catechesis training. Um, but I also know that my parents may have been more disconnected and then at home it wouldn't have been supplemented as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I really, I think that the homeschooling was the best for me, but I, I honestly have no, um, I have no experience outside of homeschooling. So I could be better, you know, like I don't know (laughs) for sure. I'm just assuming. Yeah. So the last, last question in this section, um, um, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being, um, because I was catechized in this way, I will be a saint. Uh, how would y'all rate your catechesis experience? <laughs> <clears throat> um, I, I'd probably sit it right at like an eight or a nine. I mean, <laughs> part of, that's an, one of the d- difficult. I feel like I'm asking y'all to judge your parents as like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's like, my, my dad's the best. How could he be, not be the best? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a difficult question to answer in part because um, you could have like the greatest mm-hmm. 
the greatest teacher and still end up really rotten. I mean, Alcibiades' teacher was Socrates, and look what happened to him. So, right. um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a UD podcast. Y'all can tell already. <laughs> so I, there is a lot of value, <laughs> like a big importance to having a good uh, training. It, well, actually, it's invaluable. Like it's super mm-hmm. important, but that's not it. I think it has to be like the receptiveness of the person. So yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. it was a trick question, Jeremy. I'm on to you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that mine's like at a good nine, nine and a half, just because I can't uh, say for certain if I'm going to be a saint. That's so presumptive. But I like it <laughs> helped me appreciate the Catholic faith enough to go to a Catholic college and then continue on. Um, so I feel that's like that's a that, good, yeah. like that's a good sign. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's I'm on the right said, track yeah. as of now. So. Right, exactly, exactly. What else can we ask for, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to the next section of the uh, little podcast here. So this is this is the fun part. This is where we bring out all the opinions and, and mm-hmm. deep hidden thoughts about the church. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> um, so I don't have a ton of quotes because all of my catechism books are still, all of my catechetical books are still in my room. Because uh, I had, I had to bring back the ones that I would have for class for the for like the next two weeks because that's was mm. all they, they said that they were going to cancel. And then they canceled yeah. the whole thing. Now no, they um, said a pack for everything. I did. <laughs> I no, no, they said pack for classes. <laughs> they didn't say pack up everything. I packed I know, for but... all of the all of the classes that I <laughs> like all the books that I would need for the classes for the next two weeks. Yeah, no, okay, there's, there's, there's no right. reading like for the mm-hmm. books that I for my for my foundations class. Dang. So now I'm like I'm a bit of a pickle, um, but <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't manage. No, to I agree, bro. The virus is doing us all dirty, so <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> I do. I do have. A, I do have a few, and they're not. They're not literally varied, but um, uh, they're they're mostly from the the first book that we read, which was Saint Augustine's first catechetical instruction. So if you didn't know about the book, um, basically this one of this um this bishop wrote to St. Augustine and he was asking basically he's like, hey, like I suck at catechizing. Can you help me? <laughs> like what 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 are you like what what do you think is the best way to catechize? And so this is basically St. Augustine's way of saying this is how you should teach the faith. So a few few things I wanted to ask you guys about was one theme in it um that's perpetuated throughout the text is that it's summed up in this small quote from like the end of the book, but it says, we learn in them what we teach. So I think that the the expression there means i guess that even though we're t- like even though cat, uh, catechists are in the position of giving these students the information that they don't like know beforehand teaching these people um you won't as- it's not necessarily that you'll learn new things from the the students but you'll learn more about what you're teaching them as you teach them basically mm-hmm. um agree or disagree what do you, what do you guys think about that yeah, I mean, I think that sounds <clears throat> that sounds totally plausible. As somebody who has never taught a catechism class, <laughs> that sounds like it would be true. And like, I mean, my literature professors say the same thing. Like, mm-hmm. Doctor Davis was just like, "Man, I had never thought about that when we were reading Moby Dick before, like last semester." And just like, right, going back over the same stuff. I don't know if this is what you mean, but like going back over it and like mm-hmm. thinking about it again and trying to present the material to like fresh eyes mm-hmm. you know means that you in some ways have to come at it with fresh eyes every time exactly yeah. um, no, I, I think you got a spot on there i want you could tell what do you think um i volunteered at a ccd class in high school um mainly because there was a couple of uh, kids with disabilities and they needed a, like a student helper kind of thing um but i also like subbed a, a couple of the classes and i don't know why they stuck me at one point i was like maybe a junior in high school and the class that I had to sub was all on the Eucharist. And I was like, I'm never, I'm literally in high school. Like, I'm not the teacher. And you're sticking me with this, like, really hard to explain things for sixth graders. I was like, this is, like, it, it was interesting because, I mean, obviously no. what I have to say, like, sometimes you forget all of the exact teachings on right, how to explain right. the Eucharist and you're just kind of like going to mass and you believe it, but you don't, it's kind of like mm-hmm. the, the Holy Trinity, like having a class on the Holy Trinity and you oh, hear yeah. it and it's like, Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. 
but you literally have no clue how to explain it yourself. Um, and I had to kind of like relearn how to do that, especially yeah. for sixth graders and trying to figure out how to explain it in a way that is true, but also understandable at their level. Mm-hmm. And even if it wasn't like new learning from my perspective, I definitely like was learning how to approach it to a specific age group, which I thought was definitely mm-hmm. like a new way of thinking about things. Um, so I feel like that, that makes sense to me Yeah, that you would learn more. Yeah, and y'all hit on on a big theme that Saint Augustine points in in this book, even though y'all haven't read it. Is is that is just that that it's it's adaptability to an audience that's really like what what makes like catechism, um, like catechists good is being able to take this general principle, this general material that is, you know, is the truth, is what it is right here, and and present it in a way that people that might not have just gotten the the principle itself but now like because of the way that it's presented to these certain group they're able to grasp it better and i think that was he was ahead of his time i think in the way that he he thought about um spreading the gospel um not mm-hmm. just for like you know not just preaching the gospel for the gospel's sake but preaching the gospel so that everybody understands it right um, another another sentiment that he 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 puts in the book and this might this this might be different is that he um, advises them to avoid arguing with students. Instead, he says, refute arguments with what has been foretold. Basically saying, this is the truth. If they're arguing against it, then that means that they're wrong. <laughs> so just re, like, re, like, re, um, reteach the same thing and just tell them like what you just said. Um, I don't know. I think nowadays, I think when you, try to, when you get into an argument, you, you, have, you have this you want to bring this person to understanding. And so it means like a lot of more give and take and sort of like, you know, trying to understand this person for their point of view and then, you know, change their mind. But St. Augustine says that that's kind of like a waste of time. <laughs> Cause it's like, if, if you're teaching, if you're teaching the truth, then why do you need to entertain anything else? Um, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Um, I think, Arguing can be helpful, but I feel like it's better to use the word dialoguing in a sense, um, just because yeah, it's a little less aggressive. And in like a classroom setting, I feel like it would be really hard um, or uh, not hard, but it would be almost embarrassing in, mm-hmm. to a certain degree when you're young and you're trying to understand the faith. And then um, mm-hmm. someone is kind of like aggressively <clears throat> telling you why it's wrong. Right. Um, whereas like, I love when people and like professors, there have been certain professors that I'm just like, thank you for making me not feel like an idiot when I said something stupid in class where they go, Oh, you know, I see where you're thinking this, like, um, yeah. that makes sense, but it's actually a little bit different and like re like reformatting their question so that they also mm-hmm. are seeing your point, but without arguing, I feel like, um, it's just a little bit more easy to take because then with the argument like it tends to make you feel belittled and more upset and almost a little bit rebellious like you don't want to be told in front of everyone Mm -hmm. you get more defensive and less open to learning i feel like Mm -hmm. Um, and then in that sense it is kind of a waste of time yeah i I think that like that the important thing is to not not concede your point not like say oh, well, you have a different opinion, so like, let's meet halfway. But sort of, mm-hmm. you know, trying to understand where they are helps them, helps you help them find the road to the truth, right? If you understand and can really like, uh, like Kateri was saying, dialogue with them about their point of view, even though it is incorrect, you know? Um, right. But it's not yeah, a matter of like making them question. feel like they're right, mm-hmm. but a matter of like helping mm-hmm. them understand how they can get to the truth. Very, very well said. Yeah, very well said. Um, yeah, no, and then I had one more. Let me make sure I find it here. Uh, I thought I just thought it. I just thought it was really funny. Um, in in the beginning of the book, I think one of the the main things, one of the main questions that it, that the that the bishop has writing to Saint Augustine is like, why aren't people paying attention to me? Like this, like shouldn't they be listening to the truth? And <laughs> in, in no in no uncertain terms. 
St. Augustine says, you talk too long and with too little enthusiasm. <laughs> People listen with pleasure if we present with pleasure. You have to take pleasure in what we're teaching. Um, so in that frame, do y'all think that um, th there's more benefit in taking volunteers for, for teaching in parishes um, because they would have that energy, because they have that desire to teach? Or would you... Um, take the opposite tact and say, or say, well, no, what we need is, is to have the teaching right and straight. And for that, we should have somebody that knows what they're talking about, which means like somebody that has some sort of training in the, in the, in the faith. What do y'all think about that? Hmm. Um, I would say that uh, you shouldn't allow somebody to teach catechism just because they're excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <clears throat> it, it wouldn't be doing the, you know, the, the children or the, whoever's taking the class, it wouldn't be doing that right. service by giving them a heretic, uh, <laughs> you know, like just because he's funny. <laughs> yeah. You know, just because like, he's really excited to be there. Mm -hmm. Like lots of heretics are very excited about what they're saying. Um, so, but I do think that there is a lot of value to like, you know, and I don't think you need a theologian for all of, for every class, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, it would, I, I would supply be, anyway. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, it, it is, it is a great thing to be able to teach a class. Um, but you shouldn't, but you do need to make sure that they have the proper like theological training. Right. They don't have to like have devoted their whole life to it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's balance to be found. Yeah, but, I agree. I, I feel like it shouldn't be an either or, um, situation like you said like not every teacher should be a theologian and like when you're dealing with little kids who are just you know in the preschool stages of catechesis at like ccd you don't need some great person to read to them the children's bible or like the saint Lives yeah. <laughs> and pick out points that you're you know mm -hmm. are easy to teach children virtues with but um i do think that there needs to be a little bit more screening with volunteers just because um in the CCD uh, classes that I went to back before I was even involved, like when my mom was a teacher, um, there was a woman who was teaching and I mean, she went to mass every Sunday. Like she, she seemed to know, like be a strong Catholic, but then she was literally teaching the children that the Eucharist wasn't, it was a symbol. Mm -hmm. And my mom heard that. And she like went and talked to the priest and was like, they're teaching them literally the wrong thing. Like exactly what, it makes the Catholic faith different from all these uh, different Protestant churches. And so, I mean, that was kind of scary. Like, yeah. yeah that's definitely scary. Um, so in that sense, I think that there could be more screening, like maybe an interview process to make sure that they are solid on the fundamental parts right. of the faith and then go from there. But it's so hard nowadays. Um, like in the small town that I live in, we don't even have a Catholic high school. We have like a Catholic grade school um in mm -hmm. which a lot of the, the teachers there aren't catholic um maybe like the catechesis or teacher the person who's in charge of religion teaching is but yeah, hopefully. Uh, it's hard to get them to want to teach a ccd class when they're doing yeah. it all day and they have families mm -hmm. um and so i feel like it's almost unreasonable to expect like ccd classes mm -hmm. to be taught by all catholic or i mean well definitely all catholic but like completely trained Mm -hmm. teachers right. um like professional so yeah good good yeah good thoughts on that yeah. um i discussed it with patrick and joe earlier and you know th those guys they actually they they've they were teaching at st luke's mm -hmm. over this over the past semester and something that patrick told me, patrick patrick kept saying it over and over it's like hey man i was really inexperienced they just let like you know like <laughs> they they put us in that position because we had a good reference and then we ended up and we're like, we have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> and so it's like, they've learned on the job, obviously they've gotten better as it goes on, but you know, throwing somebody just like in because they've expressed the willingness to do it. I think it causes a lot of the things that, you know, the, the reason all of the, some of the, the wounds that catechesis suffers from today, which is like, like Kateri said, people that m might not really understand church teaching are up there, supposed to explain the church's teaching to people you know so 
I think it's it's definitely something that I I would like to see like visited in in, in some sort of USCCB document or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, <laughs> the next next little portion is a little bit of a history explanation, so nice and fun. Um, but I wanted I wanted to give you guys a little bit of background on the history of catechesis and how it's kind of developed over over time. Um, so I think the biggest the biggest thing in the early church is obviously when you think of the early church, you're thinking of a very small community. This is not this is not the church we know today, which is almost spread all over the world. It's more or less concentrated in in different areas. And so Saint Cyril of Jerusalem had a very famous um, package of twenty three lectures that he would he would give in his uh, um, catechesis and his in his teaching. But even before you got to the classes, Saint Cyril like the requirement was that if you're coming and you're converting, right? If you're converting to, to, to Christianity, you have to undergo 40 days of penance, full stop, no exceptions before you could even enter a class. And so, you know, to, to like make you reflect on it. And can you imagine that? Can you imagine having a 40 day waiting period for like, <laughs> for catechism classes nowadays, the parents would go mad. It's like, what am I waiting 40 days to put my kid into confirmation class for? No one understands that. Right. And then each session was made up of, it went exorcism, a reading from scripture, a homily on the scripture, and then prayer. Obviously, because um, this is the early church, we don't have the weight of tradition yet. All of the documents and, and popes and, and councils have yet to, they have yet to come. So what we have is relying on scripture. Um, that was like the big, the big, uh, um, well, idea, <laughs> the big, the big, uh, principle behind early catechesis now as you transition into medieval times what you have is more it's you don't lose you it's not that you lose the uh, the quality of education but as the population keeps growing and the church keeps getting bigger the emphasis is more now on like getting everybody to convert right let's make sure everybody converts and make sure we have people in the churches um so that it instruction suffered a little bit because it's not that people were just being thrown, like baptized, like, oh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there you go, now go, you're, you're saved. Um, <laughs> it was more um, um, just the, really the, the basic tenets of the faith, like the prayers, um, like how to read the Bible, and, you know, an understanding of the Eucharist. That was basically it. Um, you see this a lot in missionary catechesis, and so what was it was left to more um, the home, Specifically, the home. There was a, a document written in, I think, the 1600s. I didn't put the date down here, but I'm pretty sure it was a day uh, called De Institutione uh, Locali, which um, spoke on that topic of parents passing on the faith to their children. And the 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 language it uses is is just like it's very severe. It says it's inexcusable for parents not to teach their children about the like. The prayers, the, the like scripture and the Eucharist, like it, absolutely inexcusable. And so now coming out of medieval times, now you come into modern times and you have Vatican II. And I think the, the spirit of Vatican II is in bringing back a lot of the um, traditions of the early church and synthesizing them with kind of the um, more uh, large scale conversion of, of medieval times. Because the world that we live in it's not getting any smaller. It's just get, going to keep getting bigger. So you can't go back to the early church and, and the small community and the small, um, you know, concentrated, you know, um, conversions. But you also can't, you know, leave people with only the basic tenets of the faith in a time where people aren't following faith anymore, right? And so the big example of that is the RCIA process. I don't know how many of you, I don't know if you are familiar with that or have somebody has gone through it, but the RCIA process draws a lot from the early church. Um, especially like the waiting periods and stuff. Like there's a year beforehand that you have to wait before you can go to RCIA. It's a whole year of instruction. And so it's a lot of trying to capture the best of both of these schools. Um, so I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Do you think that the church should continue on that path of trying to synthesize both of these things or should we kind of go to one school and stick to it and try to, you know, do our best with that one method of teaching? I'm sorry, it's pretty a little long-winded, but <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I I really like the way that that the church is trying to synthesize both of them. Um, because I think there's 
what the early church had in you know <laughs> acknowledging the importance of the of what the person is coming into in communion with the faith that's mm-hmm. huge and having it be just so easy to join mm-hmm. um you know it, it's awesome in the sense that it means that lots of people are joining and that's awesome mm-hmm. because everybody should be in the catholic church um yeah <laughs> but it, it i guess it would lend itself to it not being taken seriously you know so if you have these sort of um these periods of you know recollection and and prayer and penance before you decide to join maybe you'll take it more seriously Mm -hmm. um but at the same time you know the outreach to try to like try to bring people into the faith is so crucial so but like you were still like you were saying you know don't try to go back to a small community that's not that's not the way but Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would say that this is like a good step. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree with the, the like synthesizing the two. Um, just because like Sam said, it's like you don't want people to just join. You want to make sure that they're on board with mm-hmm. the Catholic faith and that they're willing to wait for the faith. Um, I don't know. It's kind of like marriage in a way. You know, you mm-hmm. have a whole waiting period yeah. between your engagement and getting married in the Catholic church. I think it's like six months. I mean, they, they don't take that lightly and this is your faith. It should be the most serious thing of all. So you want to make sure that that person is really focused on making sure that it is Mm -hmm. right for them, even though it is, you, you want them to be um, trusting in the fact that it is the right thing to do and not just diving in head first without actually Mm -hmm. knowing what they're getting into. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. Very, very well said. Very well said. Um, I think, yeah, I think that that gets lost in a lot of things. Vatican II, and this is the thing about church documents as a whole, they're written very vaguely. So it's like, they, 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 the church tries to leave a lot of room and in interpretation for people to do like things with their documents. But it also just, it, it's difficult sometimes to read these things and be like, well, like there's definitely a set way to do it. Um, I don't know. The plan moving forward, I think, is I would like there to be a lot more frequency in the way that the church deals with these things. For example, um, I'll share this with you guys a bit later. Um, I just thought of it like with the interview session I did earlier, but um, my, catechet- my, my, my class did this mapping of catechetical documents. And so we took a bunch of documents from the USCCB and, and, and the Vatican um, over like the, the 20th century, over that period of time, and we mapped them out and we put like, you know, like the tenant, like what, what the document addresses, when it was written, why it was written, for what it was written, all that stuff, right? Um, but something that I, I noticed personally, and a lot of people in my class did as well, is that these documents are spaced out very, like very, like there's, there's spaces of like 10, 15, 20 years between these documents. Um, and I understand, I obviously understand there's a process to these things. Like you can't rush them, but I also at 10 years, I don't, I don't it doesn't take people 10 years. I don't think to write, to write a document on, on a specific topic. Um, for ex- like the example that I used earlier was this, um, um, this document on youth ministry. The last one that was comprehensively written by the USCCB was in the late nineties. And now it's hard to believe it, but we're 30 years removed from the 1990s and we haven't had another document that addresses the changes that the world has seen. Like the world has moved a lot faster than the, the, the document addresses. Like a lot of the like things that we deal with nowadays for, for the youth, especially they're not addressed in that. And so I think at least in my opinion, I, I would love for there to be a more frequent, um, issuing of these things and like discussion of them um i don't know what do you guys think is like think they should take more time or have it more frequently Hmm. i'm just curious what are some of the things like like i i I totally agree that things have been moving very quickly what are some of the things that you would point to as being like the biggest i think 100 percent the biggest the biggest um biggest problem that um we saw in that document specifically and, and this is just taking this one document right and this one area of ministry um, was that there's there's not an addressing almost at all of the role that technology plays especially at least in mm-hmm. modern times the mm-hmm. 
basically what it says more or less about technology is that it can be helpful to the um, to the um, to the ministry, but it doesn't. It's not necessarily essential. You can do without it. You can like you can teach people without it. And I'm, I'm not saying that it's essential nowadays to know like to to use technology in any sort of ministry. But I think it's impossible to ignore it in the fashion that the document does, hmm. and and not address it in some way. And how does this affect our church? How does this affect the way we teach? Those are mm-hmm. questions that I think they're, they're not discussed in that document. And it's not a fault of the document. It's the time that it was written, right? No one could have seen mm-hmm. the, the, well, could have predicted the way that technology has moved. But I think that's one of the biggest things, <clears throat> personally. Sure. Um, I, I think for things like that, uh, I, I guess I'm I'm curious as to what what it would mean to address something like technology. Um, they're like, and I haven't read the document, so I don't really know, but yeah, <laughs> you know, they're like, I skimmed it. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, had the, but just, had yeah, <laughs> like as a, as a tool, it, it could be like mm-hmm. talked about and as like, as a source of new dangers, it should be talked about. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't know. I mean, I would definitely be in the camp of people saying that it should not be really used very much in catechesis. Like, I don't think the technology should be used very much in education at all because you don't learn very well on the computer. Um, That's why, like, it's in part why in many schools you're discouraged from reading on your laptop or something like that Mm -hmm. uh, because you retain if you have print. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So I don't... don't don't let me do that. You know, for, for, like... Um, I guess practical things it might be I don't know I don't know that those are quite as important for like a the bishops to to talk about as like the philosophical or like you know the theory behind the way they're going to teach and then it can be put in practice at the different parishes how they do it Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know that would be my that's my my two cents on it (laughs) Yeah, if we're going down the road of technology, I feel like something has to be said, not necessarily um, like the use of technology in catechesis, like Sam was saying, I don't really, I think it's kind of a a bad idea for children, especially, um, and in general, like inciting kind of jealousy if someone is allowed to do something on their iPad and you have it in class and there's just like the discrepancies and it's expensive. It's just, I don't think it's feasible or I don't think it should be in the classroom for catechesis um i was showing like a saint movie um but (laughs) as far as technology goes i think it is important to address it because um so many children do have ipads or phones or ipods and um they're subject to seeing um our culture in a very negative and positive way but Mm -hmm. with that also comes um style and to a certain degree in a lot of um, the books that we use in CCD classes and pamphlets and um, the way Mm -hmm. things are taught. um, Sometimes those books, you look at them and you're kind of like, oh, this is so outdated or like this Mm -hmm. isn't relevant anymore to explaining this or um, in some retrospect, it can make people not want to involve themselves in it i know sam and i being officers and crusaders for life like we were cleaning out the basement with all of our supplies and there were so many pamphlets that were just so outdated and ugly and to the point where we didn't want to read them we're like we don't really trust anything that's in these um because they just aren't relevant to the people who are giving them to uh, anymore it's they're depressing they're not uplifting like the style and the the way people receive um, like the, they just the way they look at things um, can often influence the way they're going to listen or learn um, and I yeah. think because it's always changing it's important and then people are seeing these constant changes in styles and uh, through technology mm-hmm. I feel like it is important that the church kind of take a uh, at least see the way it's influencing children so that they can also combat it in 
a better way. Um, whether that be through updating their materials more or even just knowing stupid social media trends that can yeah. kind of engage students and make them mm -hmm. listen to you more. Um, it's unfortunate it happens that way, but I feel like the church could use it to some extent mm -hmm. to really engage them and turn it to yeah. good. <laughs> uh, that's a really good point. I think it, it, it flies under the radar a bit that, you know, catechesis is the teaching of the faith. And for that, you kind of have to have a talent in teaching. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big component to that where it's like we're very concerned with people knowing the faith and loving the faith and being witnesses to the faith that we don't take into account how well can this person communicate, you know, the teachings of the faith to other people that don't understand them. Um, that was a problem that, at least in my opinion, I saw personally in my youth ministry when they changed youth ministers, is that they got this lady who, very, very nice lady. I love her to death. Right. She's a, she's a fantastic, you know, she's a fantastic um, witness to prayer. She knows a lot about the faith and stuff like that. But the woman, she can't she's not social. Like it, it almost hurts her to be in a social setting like and they put her in charge of the youth group, which is you have to get up every week and you have to be in front. You have to be leading a group of teenagers who may or may not care what you're saying to, uh, you know, in a session of something, you know, of some of of, of some importance. And so as a result, the youth group suffered because people could tell it's like this lady might know what she's talking about, but she, like, we don't want to listen to her. Right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. It's just like, she's, and she just doesn't get us. And so I think to that, to that extent, what you said, Kateri is like, you know, knowing kind of the way that technology plays nowadays, it would help you in that teaching. It's like, you know, it's not, we're not living in with just notebooks and, and textbooks anymore. We have a lot more, going on in our world um at least at a young age too because you want to engage them so that they have the yeah. um encouragement to take it on and just do textbooks when they're in college or something like that mm -hmm. but without that when you're so little and you don't want to be doing sing in religion class doing anything like it's just you need to engage them yeah yeah absolutely i think that that can come at a sacrifice sometimes so people might um be like, well, who, who can engage these people the most? And then, like like we said beforehand, it also suffers, um, catechesis suffers because that person doesn't know what they're talking about, even though that the class is paying attention, paying attention to the wrong thing. Um, so to that, to that extent, how, how do y'all think that the church can increase the number of teachers that have that balance, right? You know, between knowing what they're talking about and knowing how to talk about it. Um, in, in, in parishes specifically, because I think that's where the majority of catechesis occurs nowadays. Um, yeah, what, what do y'all think about that? How do y'all think of that? Mm, uh, I, I don't really know. I think that maybe um, as having the parish priests, you know, um, be more active in recruiting people to teach, I don't really know. I mean, the parish priests might, might be better able to judge um, assuming they have mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the proper theological training, we're gonna take that as a given here. Yeah, <laughs> um, they they would be better able to judge, you know, whether these people should be teaching catechesis mm -hmm. um, than you know some committee or whatever kind of nonsense some of these parishes have. Um, right. <clears throat> bless their I heart. think <laughs> bless it could be helpful. <laughs> I agree with Sam in that like it it's so hard and it all depends on communities um and I mean you want to get people I feel like it, it tends to be hard to get um people in parishes to step up and to volunteer um yeah. just because of time and people working um I think it could be really helpful to maybe reach out to people who have gone through RCIA because I mean they're the newest they know what they're talking about because they've just gone through it themselves right, right. and they've just committed their lives to this faith. Mm -hmm. And, um, and also there's going to be a little bit more enthusiasm in that because they have found the truth and they're going to be excited about it. So I feel like maybe reaching out to them more um, could be helpful in that retrospect, but it, it's so hard to tell. And it all depends on who is in your community. I think moms could be really good too. Like, Homes, oh, maybe yeah. school moms. I'm biased, but I mean they've taught their kids, so it's like you know they've they've got experience teaching their own children, um, mm -hmm. and 
they're usually creative because they're doing it all at home. So it could help yeah, yeah. to extent young people, I guess, if you're interviewing if they, them. If they can deal with their own kids, they can deal with other people's kids. I think that's yeah. <laughs> the logic for it. They're not as burnt out, too, if they're, like, regular teachers. <laughs> they're, they're less less exhausted <laughs> by children after a long day of working. Right, but, right, right. Um, yeah, it's so subjective to the community. I think it's hard right. to really say. Yeah, there's no really kind of objective way to kind of put that, you know, measure in place, I guess. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. I, think that's, I think that's a really, really good, really good way of looking at it. Um, so the third part of this and the final part, it's a nice little short one. Um, just a couple of questions, I think. Um, Kateri, I don't think you'll ever be able to do, like, actually do this, but you're Pope for a day. Oh. Fine. <laughs> Try me. <laughs> Fine, right? <laughs> I dare you. I dare you, Kateri. <laughs> Just Reform. for that room, like, I'm, I'm going to be Pope. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Pope for a day. So what, like, what are you doing to improve the Catholic catechesis? Are you calling a council? Are you issuing a new encyclical? Or are you leaving it, like y'all said a lot, to, are you leaving it to the, to the, to the bishops of, of every kind of, like, you know, country on earth to figure that out for themselves? Mm-hmm. Well, um, oh gosh, I'm not cut out to be Pope. <laughs> you go first, Sam. <laughs> um, well, if I was Pope for a day, the first thing I do is thank God that I only had to be Pope for one day. Um, and then I would probably, <clears throat> I don't want that many souls on my back. <laughs> um, it's a big job. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I don't know for, for what would I improve in terms of Catholic catechesis? I don't, I'm not so sure that making like some, um, you know, calling a council or writing an encyclical, maybe, maybe writing an encyclical with like suggestions, um, Mm -hmm. just sort of like a call to be more active in the parish and like be involved in volunteering to do catechesis Mm -hmm. and get the, the formation. But, uh, you know, to like lay down rules about that, I I feel like would be very difficult um because of what we've been talking about just that like how widely the different parishes vary mm-hmm. that you know i think there would be a lot of value in just sort of advising the bishops in the way that <clears throat> you know if i were to give it much more thought than i have now then i would probably just advise the bishops on sort of like mm-hmm encouraging them to do certain things. Um, but, you know, leaving it up to them because they know their communities. Um, right. And hopefully if they're the bishops, they're, you know, as interested in as I would as Pope in yeah. having their, their faithful be educated. So, um, right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else I would be able to do. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of what I'd say. Mm-hmm. So Pope yeah. Terry, what do you got? Uh, um. <laughs> I think I'm like on the same track as you. There isn't much I think that needs to be changed except for maybe like, I feel like I would make a very rousing call to try and get more people involved and in wanting to learn their faith actively so that they could teach and express maybe a grave importance in that um, more so, I guess. Um, yeah. Just make a really rousing call to for people to stand up and to, take um care in the way that their children are going to be educated in catechesis and then yeah you just have to leave it up to the priest because i think that the main problem is finding people who will do it because i think we have a very good way of mm-hmm. of handling catechesis if we could get people to do it who are good um mm-hmm. so yeah right, I think right. that's my main that'd be my main concern Man, I try to give y'all all this power and you don't want to do anything with it. <laughs> no, but I, I think that's really interesting. I think to see that. A lot of people, I, I guess the answers I've gotten today is is more more about that. It's like, wh- I, I don't think you can do anything at that level. And it's like the change comes from the ground up, I guess, and then, mm-hmm. then top down, at least in, in this subject. Um, yeah, no, it's, that's interesting. I didn't think I'd get those answers. That people would like go power mad and... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Force everybody to go to church every day. I don't know. <laughs> or you're excommunicated. 
I don't know what I expected out of that question, honestly. I just really like Maybe it. there could be more perks. I don't know. Like some more. we can't go back five, to selling. Five bucks businesses. if you come to Mass yeah. every day. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send you we'll send like instead of you giving us a check, we'll send you a check. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how feasible it'd be, but I think it'd be kind of cool if, like, the Pope sent out all these little rosaries or something to, like, uh, teachers to give out. It'd be, like, so unreasonably, woo! like, there's just so much. But, like, I don't know, some perk, maybe a special blessing. Right. Makes, I it, guess. makes it feel wanted, yeah. 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 Well, with that, guys, the most interesting question of the day. I think that's where we're going to finish up the recording. Um, thank you guys again so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, with the whole quarantine and the virus going around, I was like, I did not know how I was going to do this. But then, like, I was like Google searching, just kind of off topic. I was like, how do I record a podcast <laughs> when everybody and everybody's like a thousand miles away? Um, yeah, yeah. This 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 software popped up. Squadcast is, I tell you, it's a, it, it's a, it's a it's a blessing. Take it as a yeah. Holy Spirit saying, go ahead, do your little podcast thing i hope it helps i know it's probably prime time that you're doing it right now too because no one can say no like and <laughs> like, like no one has anything to do it's like yeah man, no one really, has like, what are you doing <laughs> and they oh, know it so home. they can't say no <laughs> so it's like it's, it's like if they say no they're like oh i'm doing something else it's like well i'm about to call your governor and tell him about the house <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Put> in jail. <laughs> all right guys that'll, that'll finish up this episode um, next yeah. up tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon is uh, Alex. Uh, Alex and Colette will be on here, so I'll be talking to them. Um, thank you guys a lot for you coming on. You stuck with Sam. I couldn't have been on that podcast. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kateri. All I mean, right. I mean, when I, when I here, <laughs> when I pitched this idea to you guys, Kateri was like, "Oh my god, wouldn't it be so funny if we did it with Sam?" It's like mm-hmm. we all know each other. Mm-hmm. So I don't remember that. No. Yeah, you better watch it. I'm not voting for you for president next year. You <laughs> <laughs> definitely said that. Otherwise, I wouldn't. But very good conversation. <laughs> I really appreciate everything you told me. Yeah. No, thank good. you for having me on here, Jay. Really good. Yeah, thank you. And that's all. <laughs> hey there, loyal listener. I'm Jerm, the host and creator of the Catholic Podcast. If you like what you heard, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Still want more? You can find a whole blog's worth of my thoughts on just about anything faith-related at catholic.weeby.com. Thanks for listening, and God bless.